This video is sponsored by my Lightroom Editing Masterclass. 50 high quality videos over 11 hours to take you from Lightroom beginner to Lightroom pro. More on that later on in the video. So film has been having a little bit of a moment recently, at least, you know, in the, the better half of the last decade, in my opinion. And more and more people are uh, going to film cameras and film photography because, you know, they like the look that you get out of camera or, you know, they like the experience of actually shooting with a little bit more of a vintage camera and slowing down and being more intentional with their photographs and all those kind of things. And, you know, I think film photography in general is, is absolutely lovely. And I think the more people that get into photography, the better it is for all of us. I myself don't personally shoot film for a bunch of different reasons, but you know I do respect a lot of photographers out there who do shoot film, and I have a lot of friend photographers who are also out there shooting film every day. And so, you know, the more people who shoot film, the better. I think it's it's great. There's more enough space for all of us. But there are a a couple of people who. I would say are a little bit maybe too biased towards film and say that, you know, film can't be emulated in digital or you can't have a digital uh, image look like a film image or, you know, digital photography will never look the same as film photography and all those kind of things. And I think that statement is just like flat out wrong. <laughs> and I want to spend this video showing you guys why they're you know, why that's just wrong. And that's just flat out not the case. And I think there's so much versatility in both film stocks, and there is an equal versatility in Lightroom and the way you edit images as well to look like those film stocks. And that's what we'll be going through in this video. So the thing about film is that there's this kind of uh, collective mentality that film has a, a one specific look, or it has a, a look to it, right? But the thing with film is that there are so many different types of film stocks to choose from and every single one of those film stocks has a different look. That's why you go for those film stocks in the first place, right? And even then, picking a, a roll of film within the same film stock can have minor differences from roll to roll. And so, you know, you're always going to get these these minor variances with film and you're always going to get these vast look changes with the film stocks that you're using. And so when people blanket statements say that film looks a certain way, you know, in most occasions, that's not the right way to think about it. It's more that certain film stocks have specific looks which people are drawn to. And so, when it comes to thinking about how to emulate film in the digital world, you have to realize that every single film image is going to look different, right? And that, you know, generally there are a couple of, I guess, characteristics of film photography that you could say are distinctively film-like, I suppose. But these are broad sweeping generalizations. And as I said, they're definitely different from, from role to role, from stock to stock, et cetera, et cetera. But generally speaking, uh, you know, film images can have quite a lot of grain depending on, you know, the speed that the film is shot on. They can typically look uh, desaturated, at least a lot of the... The film fanboys out there like the whole desaturated look, so that's generally what the zeitgeist of film photographers go for, but that's not necessarily saying that every single roll of film is desaturated by default, again. And then we can say that generally speaking, uh, film images look less sharp, and that is a product from the actual technology at the time where film was commonly used. You know, we've had so many developments in the lens space and in the, the sensor space in modern day technology that, you know, it, it just it's just not the same. I mean, you know, vintage glass and, and vintage cameras are just not as sharp as modern day glass and modern day cameras. That's just that's just how it is. But we can say as a generalization, as you know, a uh, uh, incomplete not 100% fully correct broad generalization that images from film cameras are going to be less sharp than digital cameras. And so, you know, again, there's a whole bunch of different looks to film images, whether, you know, you're shooting on Kodak Gold 200 or like Ekta or a Portra 400 or whatever the, the case may be, you know, there's always going to be a different look. And so when we're going into the process of trying to emulate these film looks, 
keep in mind that every single image that you're going to be analyzing and breaking down needs to be treated on a image by image basis. So I was looking through all of my friends who shoot film and trying to find examples that we could use today. And I stumbled across this image by my friend Jazz who shoots film in Japan. Typically she shoots on 35 mil or you know medium format. And I'm not too sure exactly what film stock she used for this image, but it doesn't really matter that much because again, like I said, every single film stock is going to be different anyway. So your approach to analyzing it will have to be bespoke and unique every single time anyway. So with this image, I picked it because I think it's a really nice image as a whole. You know, I think it has a lot of uh, story. It was taken as a nice little moment. There's a lot to say about this image when it comes to, you know, composition and all this other kind of different things. But I'm not going to be commenting too much on those portions of this image today. I'm going to be commenting more on the reason why I chose this image in the first place, which is that I think it has a lot of characteristics that have that analog and vintage feel that has the film look that we can work with and break down and then try and understand and learn and then apply to our own edits down the road. So what we're gonna be doing is breaking down this image and I'm gonna be telling you guys what I see so that we can then replicate that in a image that we will then go and edit in Lightroom and try and emulate this film style. With this image, you know, what I, I see from the top, if we wanna start from, let's say, exposure. So we have a very bright sky here. And this is, you know, in terms of exposure is a photographer's choice. Uh, Jazz in this instance has decided to to have you know the sky quite bright here and overall this image is quite bright maybe just a tad overexposed and that's kind of that like washed out kind of feel and I think that's quite nice but one of the other defining features that I wanted to talk about here especially with this image is that the blacks and the shadows are quite what's called crushed right. So what we can see is usually in the the hair of the model here, we would have strands of hair that you could see. We would have details in the shadows that you would be able to see, the, the textures of her shirt and all these kind of things. But in this case, this particular role of, you know, this particular stock of film doesn't show you those details in the shadows. And this is one, one of the, the few things that a lot of different film stocks have, they have crushed blacks typically. And that's one thing that we wanna take note of for later on down the track. There's no detail in the shadows, so keep that in mind. In terms of color here, this particular image has quite a strong purpley magenta color cast, not only in the highlights here, but also in the midtones and especially in the shadows as well. The shadows, it has a little bit of a magenta tone, but also in my eyes, at least on this monitor anyway, has just a very small hint of green in there as well, which is very interesting. And I think that that kind of color shift is something that you have to very intentionally do when you're trying to edit that in Lightroom. Also something of note here is that the color of the red shirt that the person is wearing here is quite dark from a luminosity perspective and it's also a little bit desaturated just just a smidge it's it's not too over the top it is quite subtle and i think that is one of the 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 defining features when it comes to color for this specific image now another thing i'm seeing here is sharpness or the lack thereof and i mentioned this before as well uh, but generally, you know, film images aren't going to be as tack sharp as digital modern day uh, images with the latest gear and all that kind of stuff. With this image, Jazz intentionally or unintentionally, I mean, she says unintentionally in, in the, uh, the caption here, but the focus is missed on the main model. And instead you can see it's kind of like, I don't know, around here, like you can see the the leaves on the trees, which is kind of on the shore of the beach that the, the model is behind here. And, you know, so the, the focus is a little bit further back, but even where the focus is, it's not tack, tack sharp. And this is quite characteristic just in general for film images. They're not super, super razor sharp. So that's also something to uh, keep in mind. 
And then the final thing that I'm noticing here is grain. So this is another characteristic that's very common in film photography is that film has a specific look when it comes to grain. And there generally is a lot more grain in film images than in digital images. Of course, that has so many different variances and, and so many different reasons as to why, so I'm not gonna dive into them. But with this image, you know, you can see a lot of the grain in the subject's face, in the shadows here on the hair, and just all over generally, even in the sky here as well. Uh, on this image, there's a lot of grain, and so we're gonna be adding that into our edits for our digital version in Lightroom as well. So with all of the analysis done here, we can move into Lightroom and we can take what we've learned and apply that to a digital version of the image that we're going to be editing in Lightroom. But before we do that, if you are a beginner at Lightroom or you know, you've been using Lightroom for a couple of years and you wanna know the absolute best workflow from start to finish, or you want to know exactly what every single tool in the Lightroom does explained in detail, or you just really just wanna generally upskill your editing game, then check out my Lightroom Editing Masterclass. It is a course that I've carefully designed to help you master Lightroom over 11 hours spread into 50 lessons over eight modules. And it covers absolutely everything you need to know to edit well in Lightroom. I cover the best way to import your images, editing fundamentals, advanced and creative editing, building your own style and your visual aesthetic. And then I even end off the course with hours upon hours of real world, real time editing of my portfolio images, my highest quality images. And I share with you every single tip and trick and technique that I know about Lightroom. So if you are interested in really upskilling your Lightroom game, then head over to patk.com forward slash Lightroom dash masterclass and join the course. Okay, so for the image that we're going to be editing for this video and for as an example, we're going to be using this image that I took of my girl Steph in Hawaii. And I chose this image specifically because I feel it had similar tonality to the reference image from Jazz, for example. And I feel like there's a lot of potential in terms of the colors that are going to be very similar that we can use and contrast together and you know constantly flip back and forth towards and I feel it's going to net us the most smooth experience when it comes to trying to emulate this film image. And so to begin the edit, we're going to be editing this image in exactly the same way that I broke down the reference image from Jazz here. And the first thing that I mentioned previously was about the exposure and specifically the highlights in general as well. So we're gonna start with that. So we're gonna go over to the basic uh, panel here. And we're just gonna up the exposure just to give it a kind of like light and uh, airy and little bit overexposed feel. We're going to be upping the highlights here and just a little bit and then, you know, upping the whites a little bit as well, I think is quite nice. And the second thing it was about shadows and on the reference image, you know, I mentioned that the shadows didn't have a lot of detail. They were crushed in, uh, in the reference image here. And so we're gonna be doing that and replicating that with this image as well. So in order to do that, what we can do is either slide the shadows up and down, but I generally tend to like to use the tone curve to control the contrast. And so we're gonna be adding a, a typical S curve here, but instead of the normal S curve where you might do something like, like this or something that looks like that, uh, we're actually going to be grabbing this last node here and dragging it up. And as you can see, that actually makes all of the black and dark and shadow portions of this image a little bit more white or a little bit more clipped. Uh, or crushed is, you know, whatever word you want to use. There's so many different words for it, right? And what I want to do is just really spend the time to finesse uh, what the shadows look like, especially in the hair. I can zoom in a little bit and I can still see the, the strands of hair in uh, the shadows here as well. And so I want to just, you know, push these down just a little bit. Uh, and then clip this even more, something like that, just so that we mush all of the detail together. I think that's starting to look a little bit better, something like this. 
And I think that's good for now. We'll leave that and maybe come back to it if we need to. So the second thing I wanted to work on is the color. So the color, if you remember here in the reference image was very purpley. There was a significant purple magenta tone to this image and we wanna try and replicate that. For general tonality and general color changes, for me, I always recommend using the white balance to affect a global color change first and then doing all your changes after that. So with this image, we have quite, I would say it's it's a, a cool-ish kind of color with more of a preference and a lean towards the magenta already, which is kind of nice, but we can try and just push that just a little bit more, something like that, and then a little bit more blue too. Something that that looks good, but we don't want to go too overboard. That's probably a little bit too much. Now, uh, one thing, one characteristic that I mentioned before is that, you know, the shadows and the highlights all had quite a very strong purple magenta tinge. And that's what we're going to try and emulate now. So there's a couple of ways we can do that. And typically you might think that we would do that in color grading and 100% we, we can do that and we might return to that. But I did want to mention uh, using the calibration tool here for this job, especially in the shadows. And if you haven't watched my video on the calibration tool and exactly what every single one of these options does, then I'll leave a link down to that video in the description box below. But for this particular image, I wanna just up the shadows into a more magenta look, just subtly, and that gives our shadows a, a very slight magenta tinge, not too much. Uh, you know, we can go to the extremes and see what that looks like and that's what it looks like and that's too much for me. Uh, but I wanna do something that looks more like, yeah, something like that looks nice to me. And that will affect uh, all of the shadow portions of this image and target those and up the magenta with that toggle. Now that we've got a little bit of a purple preference to the image, what I wanted to replicate is that back in the reference image, there's, there's I don't know, in, at least in my monitor anyway, there's a little hint of green in the shadows as well. And we can replicate that by just using a very subtle uh, green here in the color grading. So, you know, I'll pick the right color of green, which is probably more like, like this to my eye and then a very low saturation, something like, you know, four or something like that. Even maybe even lower. And this is super subtle and it's very difficult to tell because, you know, green and magenta or like green and purple are contrasting colors. So when you add one, it kind of cancels out the other. So it, it is quite difficult to tell, but I can see on my monitor anyway that there is not only a, a kind of purpley overtone to the image, but there's also a very slight green undertone to this shadow area. And I think that starts to give it that, that little film look and that film color. Now, another thing that I noticed with the reference image here is that where a lot of oranges and a lot of yellows could be in the sky, they're actually quite, quite blown out and quite desaturated, as well as the sky in terms of the, the color of blue is a lot more blue than it is purple. There's a lot of purple in the shadows down here in the bottom right for sure, but this blue up in the clouds up here is definitely a, a very strong blue, and so I wanna try and replicate that color. But first, I will go to the orange and the yellow and try and up the luminance, which will by nature of upping the luminance will drag down the saturation at the same time. Something like that. And just for posterity, I'm also going to take some of the saturation out of the orange as well. And that then takes the saturation out of um, Steph's skin tone as well, which is quite nice and quite what we're, uh, we're looking for. In terms of the sky, it's already looking just a little bit too purple for me. So I wanna just change the blue just a smidge over that way. And I wanna add some blue to the general purple that's going, especially here. I think that's quite nice as well. Something like that. That looks good to me. 
Uh, now, I mentioned before in terms of the reference image that the colors in general are, you know, they're quite dark overall, but they're also quite desaturated in general as well. So what we can do is we can actually go back into the lumens and we can kind of add a lower luminance value to all of the colors except the ones that we were using for the sky. And that will, by nature, increase the saturation just in general. And so we'll have to go back into the global saturation values and just bring that down just a little bit, just to balance. And so, you know, you can see what I'm doing here is going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and, and trying to just tweak and change and shove and move just by little bits at a time, just trying to take my time with this edit and trying to replicate it as best as possible. But we're getting really close in my opinion when it comes to exposure, when it comes to color, as to what the reference image from Jazz was, something like this. Okay, so the last two things I wanted to cover in this image was sharpness and grain. So with sharpness, you know, I mentioned before that you know, this is, this is shot on an RX100. This is a little pocket camera, and this is way sharper than, you know, the old vintage film lenses that you used to get. And so I wanna reduce the amount of sharpness, and there's a couple of ways we can do that. Um, but I also wanna add grain at the same time, and, and, and it'll make a little bit more sense as to why I'm mentioning these two things at the same time as well. So the first way we can kind of unsharpen this image is, you know, we can obviously turn down the sharpening that's uh, applied default by Lightroom uh, and that's not too bad, but then we can also go up and, and do things like maybe a minus texture. We don't wanna go a minus clarity because that will introduce a lot of haloing throughout the entire image. Uh, and that's not the look we're trying to go for, but we can go minus texture. But what I tend to do if I need to do this process is I'll actually go into a mask and get a, a big gradient filter and cover the entire image like this. And I'll actually use this minus sharpness down here uh, that you don't get with the main sharpness tool. And so that already looks far less sharp than the original. And we can take this to the extreme and see what that looks like. That's obviously not where we wanna go, uh, but that's what it looks like. And I would say that something like this would be just a wee bit sharper than what the reference image looks like. Uh, and I think I'm gonna leave it just a little bit less than that. And that will make, this will make a lot more sense in, in just a second. But if we go back to you know, our reference image, we can see everything's bokeh, even, but even the things that are in focus down here are not super sharp anyway. But the reason why I'm separating this process out like this is because the process of adding grain, digital grain to an image can also at the same time cause a perceived uh, blurriness and unsharpening of the image. And so we can go down to the grain slider here. We can add like, I don't know, let's say like a 50 just to start with. And we can see that the, there is a lot of grain added to the image. We can zoom in and see what the grain looks like. And you know, it's nice, uh, typically grain, just in general, when it comes to digital images is quite like fine uh, when you just leave it stock standard like this. But when we compare it to our reference image, we can see that the grain here is quite rough. It's quite big, it's quite textured. You don't see the individual bits of grain in film typically. Uh, and that's kind of one of the, one of the characteristics about film grain that people think looks nice about it. And so that's what we kind of want to replicate here. And uh, with that, what we can do is we can increase the roughness. I'll just zoom in here. We can increase the roughness of the image like that. And you can see what this does. Um, and I'm not too sure whether the YouTube compression uh, will show you exactly what's going on here. But you know, I, I cranked this all the way to 100 where previously it was 50. So this is 50 now, that's 100, this is 50. That's 100. And we can see that the size of the grain and the texture of the grain becomes more pronounced. And that's nice. We, we probably don't want you know this much. Uh, so we'll tone it down just a little bit. 
And now the reason why I left the size option to last is because the size increases obviously the size of the grain, but at the same time, it also reduces the sharpness of the image as well. So this is a kind of balance you have to find between uh, you know, how much you make the image deliberately not sharp versus how much size you give the grain, which also makes the image not sharp as well. So you have to find that delicate balance. So with this, you know, if I up it to, let's say 33, what I'm trying to look for now is, you know, is the the texture and the, the pattern of the grain, it's very easy to see in the shadows here, is this pattern, not necessarily the amount, but the pattern, does that look reminiscent of our reference image here and it's getting there especially when you compare it to the the grain on on the chest here uh it's not too bad but it's definitely in terms of amount like if i zoom out it's way too much so i want to just bring the main grain control down in terms of the amount and i think you know i could probably get away with a bigger size when i'm zoomed out like this uh, but definitely want to decrease the amount just a little bit, maybe increase the size just a little bit more, something like that. And where I'm looking at right now is, you know, the sky up here, how pronounced is the grain? When I'm looking at the shadows here, how pronounced is the grain in the shadows as well? And I think that is looking a lot better. In terms of overall, like final tweaks, you know, is this kind of as unsharp as it could be, I could probably play around, you know, with this and make it a little bit less sharp like that. And then I would spend, you know, at least a, a good couple of minutes trying to tweak and change the colors and the contrast to something that is just a little bit more film like. For me personally, I actually like the washed out look when it comes to, to film. So although I have this version as it is, and you know, really quickly, I'll, I'll go back and forth between like, you know, um, this version and the original. So the original looks like this, and then this is the, the edited film version. I would actually do something like this where I would up the shadows and then, you know, I'll drag down the exposure just a little bit. Uh, and I would actually clip this even more typically and then also drag down just the saturation globally just a little bit more like this. So this is the kind of film look that, that I prefer. Um, and then you can even take it a step further if you would like and make it you know, a little bit more warm. There are a lot of different film stocks that warm up images and there are a lot of film stocks that you know, cool down images like this as well. So Honestly, this is the power that you have with Lightroom and editing images in a filmic kind of way in that you're not stuck to a particular film stock. You can decide to choose what the film look looks like to you for whatever tastes you have. And yeah, so play around with these kind of techniques. What we're looking for, again, just to, to recap is to really analyze to sit down with a film like image and break all of the characteristics that make it a film image down and then apply those characteristics to a digital image of yours that you want to turn into a, a film look and this kind of technique is is how you replicate and uh, imitate any look of you know your favorite photographers or your favorite style of editing whatever the case may be you try and edit and you try and adjust and change and tweak until you get to a particular look yeah and that's pretty much it so i wish you all the best in your breakdowns of your film looks it is a really good skill to have to be able to look at an image and break down the core components of what makes it unique and what makes it special and you know replicate that with your own edits in Lightroom and if you are looking to up your Lightroom editing game then make sure to join the course over at patcade.com forward slash Lightroom dash masterclass where you will no longer need to watch tutorials like this if you finish that course and you will know everything from start to finish, all of my secrets in Lightroom, all of that good stuff. So head on over there and I'll hope to see you in the course. For now, for this video, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. But until then, get out there and make something that matters. All right, peace.